In our world, there will be no emotions except fear, rage, triumph and self-abasement. The sex instinct will be eradicated. We shall abolish the orgasm. There will be no loyalty except loyalty to the party. But always there will be the intoxication of power. Always, at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. The moral to be drawn from this dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. Don't let it happen. It depends on you. Come on, George Orwell. Oh, you silly Fabian. That world hasn't happened today. Sure, fear, rage, triumph, and self-abasement thrive unchecked while people linger on their social media channels or tunnel reality preferred websites, ignoring romance and mating, only loyal to whatever partisan illusion the Archons have manufactured for the masses. And yes, yes, people are intoxicated with the power of being irate and indignant on the internet. Thrilled at the victory of some corporate-funded thought leader who seems to eviscerate or demolish the other side in a two-minute video clip. Okay, sure, sure, but there is no boot on anyone's face over and over again except on the financially oppressed, lost minorities, and, uh, and oh boy, everyone else who has marketing and propaganda marching on their awareness all day long, without mercy, over and over again. No, your future hasn't happened, Georgie boy. Or did it finally happen? Or has it always been happening and we allowed it? Your problem is not technology. The problem is you. Then help us, Jay. I cannot change your nature. Well, that's why you came here. To stop it. To not let it happen. And like the ancient Gnostics, to go back in time and find out why it's always happening and reverse the bloody course. I can't think of anyone more adept in making us understand Orwell's warning come true than our astral guest. Think of this episode as a 2017 summary from a Gnostic and magical viewpoint, and a prediction of 2018, a year that will surely be even more soul dystopian as Jehovah and his angelic mafia turn up the crazy and the ignorance of humanity. But what do we have left once we abandon the lie? Chaos. A gaping pit waiting to swallow us all. Chaos isn't a pit. Chaos is a ladder. Ah, so glad to have Gordon White here at the Virtual Alexandria, here at Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. A remarkable interview where Gordon unpacks these high weirdness times, granting you the gnosis to become liberated, to stop that boot from stamping on your face over and over again. We won't get fooled again. As Philip K. Dick says in The Divine Invasion, What a tragic world this is. Those down here are prisoners, and the ultimate tragedy is that they don't know it. They think they are free because they never have been free and do not understand what it means. This is a prison and few men have guessed. But I know because that is why I'm here to burn the walls, to tear down the metal gates, to break each chain. To consider the possibility that God does not like you, never wanted you, 
In all probability, he hates you. This is not the worst thing that can happen. It isn't. We don't need him. We don't I agree. I got to Fuck damnation, man. Fuck redemption. We are God's unwanted children. So be it. Okay, so Gordon is the author of the Chaos Protocols, Pieces of Eight, and Starships, three outstanding, groundbreaking books, as well as the host of the thought-provoking, soul-liberating podcast, Rune Soup. For more information on this chaos magician always crusading against the lawful rulership of the Demiurge, please visit runesoup.com. And I am, and I am Abraxas, in his meat sack incarnation of Miguel Connor, broadcasting from the lawful but frigid dystopia of Chicago, patiently waiting for the beginning of the world. I am your pompous of Gnosis, that voice in the wilderness crying out for your indwelling Christ and inner palace Athena. Hell, I'm gonna grant you the greatest wish. I'm gonna show you a world without sin. I'm so glad you've decided to stop being frogs in boiling water because the entire world is burning with madness and there are so many chains that need to be broken with our divine invasion. It's sad that humanity's main characteristic is that we are tribal animals who continually war with each other. This has been the truth for tens of thousands of years. At least that is what aliens would see from above. The Gnostics were accused of being elitist, but would the aliens notice those small pockets of artists, inventors, and holy men feeding the poor and sick? Would they notice that a few at the top pull strings to cause distracting violence while they hoard all the resources? Or would they tell us we're all complicit and not worth the secrets of the universe? Maybe the gods feel the same way. Does man, that marvel of the universe, that glorious paradox who sent me to the stars, still make war against his brother? So listen to Gordon, detach from your prejudices and social media feeds, and do something interesting today and the rest of your existence. Like Tobias Churton wrote, Gnosis is the religion of the artist, and the artist is simply man doing what man does best, being a joyful co-creator, manifesting light in the dark universe. And don't forget the power of magic in these do or die times. As Gordon himself writes in the Chaos Protocols, Magic is always the tactic of last resort for those who refuse to give up hope. You do not summon Cthulhu to help you find the TV remote. You only visit the witch at the edge of the village when all other options have been explored. For she is the lone shark of the gods. Magic's only other requirement is that you always put a question mark after the word reality and truly own the responsibility that comes with doing so. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Thank you so much for those who have supported and kept this Red Pill Cafeteria open. In 2017, with the new site and member section, I have doubled the guests and shows created some engaging videos, and brought leading voices to write for the site's blog. I have been on various podcasts and written in some lofty places like Graham Hancock's blog. I hope I have delivered as you have supported, and hope to continue in 2018. My best advice is always to write your own gospel and live your own myth. For 2018, I would suggest read more books and less manure on the internet. And pray and meditate like your soul depends on it, because it really does. Have an experience. Love like you've never loved before. If we have souls, they are made of the love we share. Undimmed by time. Unbound by death. 
For me, it's been a fascinating year. Concerning the subscription service, I know that people contend what is true and real on the internet should be free. But to ramp up the content and its quality, I needed to do this. I have no advertisers. The whole venture depends on you and only you, my beloved true seekers. I even debase my Amazon affiliate program as to not become beholden to another evil corporation. I do use YouTube advertising, but that brings pennies each month as YouTube marked me as a questionable and radical creator, which means I'm basically invisible to their search engines. Seems to happen a lot with independent media these days. Charlene, the smut snatchers are here for everyone's protection. Censorship is American as apple pie, so shut up. So again, you keep this red pill cafeteria open. Only you. I'm truly grateful for you veterans of a thousand psychic wars. And yes, just in case you wanted to know, that term is from Michael Moorcock's lyrics on a Blue Oyster Cult song that happened to appear on the film Heavy Metal. I am also eternally grateful for the eternal assistance of our webmaster Luthien and producer Vance, supporters like Zoe and Scott, and for those of you like DJ Atwood and Marvelin who assist with production, clips, and transcriptions. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. Led us to the interview with Gordon White on a Gnostic and Magical Review of 2017 and some predictions for 2018. The Empire Never Ended. All my life I've awaited your coming and dreaded it. Like death itself. What? I terrified you from the first, Doctor. I still do. You're afraid of me and you hate me. Why? Because you're a man. And you're right. I have always known about man. From the evidence, I believe his wisdom must walk hand in hand with his idiocy. His emotions must rule his brain. He must be a warlike creature who gives battle to everything around him. Even himself. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us we definitely have the pleasure, as always, to have Gordon White to discuss a lot of heretical sundries, including this uh, crazy year and uh, what might be in the future. How are you doing today, Gordon? I'm doing really well, Miguel, and uh, and it's an honor to be here to say, get out to 2017. <laughs> yes, I would agree. I would agree. And uh, also with us, we've got the Moondog Vance. How are you doing today, Vance? I'm great. Locked and loaded. Ready to go. All right, good. Let's go hunt some archons. So tell us, Gordon, if you had to uh, describe 2017 in between three and 10,000 words, how would you describe it? I think you can probably do it in a sentence, which is the uh, inevitability or fulfillment of several decades of variance from, you know, a a, a worthwhile um, Western culture. So if if you look, if you can consider 2017 the cancer rather than the smoking. I think uh, I think that's where a lot of people um, maybe need to to think a little bit deeper about the self evidently terrible uh, events that have gone on in 2017 as not being new, uh, as being genuinely the inevitability of of a lot of stuff that predates. Uh, you know, certain leaders on the world stage uh, that predates their arrival. That would be how I would think of it as the cancer rather than the smoking. So you would say it's, uh, the chickens have come home to roost. 
Would that be another good analogy? Yeah, yeah, that is another one. This is, um, I mean, I, I use it in the in the weekly newsletter all the time as a as a phrase. But it, these are the things that happen at this point in the timeline, and uh, and if we are to think with it or on a personal and collective basis, uh, look for the next available best steps. Um, the first of those steps is to to see the continuity rather than the split. Could you expand a little bit on that? Or is this, uh, with this are we getting too abstract? No, oh, well, I could. I mean, it's a Gnosticism show, so we can rely <laughs> yes. on, say, uh, Grant Morrison and the Invisibles, The Empire Never Ended. Uh, this is kind of that, that general idea that whilst it may be, uh, and this is in, to some extent by design in terms of um, control of digital platforms, but whilst it may be more consistently in our face, the uh, the way of thinking about it, and on a spiritual and practical level, the next steps are the same as they were in Alexandria in 300 AD. And that's an interesting point you bring up. Uh, very recently, and right before your show, I interviewed Mr. Knowles, and uh, we it was, uh, again, sort of the same theme, what it was 2017, except I asked him about when he rebooted The Secret Sun, and the, the first sentence was, we are living in Gnostic times. Would you agree with that, Gordon? Absolutely. Uh, the Gnosticist. I think uh, I think this would give even um, the Setians a run for their money. I, I think uh, <laughs> in, in the West, I think... Uh, even if you don't subscribe to Gnosticism without at least having some, some Gnostic maps, uh, the risk of going a little bit crazy uh, is is quite high. And what can be done? I mean, maybe we should unpack a little bit more about the Gnostic times. I mean, uh, what do you mean by this? Or I'd love to hear your take about why these are Gnostic times. Why does it uh, give the Sethians a run for their money? Reality is, as a premise of Gnosticism, as you know, um, the reality we experience is not just false, but faked. Uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is engineered as a falsehood. And that's not just making comments about media in, in 2017, although that's obviously where people's minds go first. On a a uh, foundational premise basis, a lot of the ways in which we validate truth in the 21st century are deliberate falsehoods. And it, it, you find that in pharma, um, with each passing month, you get new articles coming out about how we can no longer trust medical research because it's riddled with big pharma interests. Uh, that's kind of the story of the day, and particularly in America, it's uh, extremely over-medicalized and over-diagnosed and so on. So the kind of truth claims you're getting on a health basis are false, but also false in an entrapment sense. And that bleeds into other things like uh, the food supply and, and nutritional advice and so on. If you just look across the spectrum of um, sources of knowledge that you should have as a human to live your best or, or a meaningful life or so on um, from a, from a media and from a health and from a food and, and from an economic perspective uh, it's, it, it's not just fake. It's, it's falsified. And that is a quintessential Gnostic dilemma. It is that reality is not just not what it seems. You can find that in spiritual traditions around the world. Reality is an op and, uh, and, and you don't need to, go full Alex Jones to have it all kind of controlled by a small group of people at the very top for that to still be true because it is uh, reality is structured at the moment as, as an op and uh, and it becomes what that does is, is changes uh, your um, I guess exposure to risk is what you should be thinking of for the next best steps because you have the option of um, trying to figure it out, which to some extent is, is a fool's errand and, and not really something. Um, well, that was sort of the tier two thing Gnostics would do. The first thing they would do is wake up. The second thing they would do is, is kind of over describe the, the layer after layer of demons in the, in the cosmic onion between them and, and them. And I think that changing it from no one knows what's going on to we're so far past no one knows what's going on that you might as well describe reality as a deliberately constructed op 
is why it just seems so so fundamentally gnostic there's there's that uh breakdown of of trust in in truth validation and this is why you need the map because uh it it doesn't mean necessarily the world's ending uh it, it what it does if you can kind of look at it soberly is suggest um a different course of action than going along with it and expecting it to correct because that would if you ask the valentinians or the or the setians about that they wouldn't say that it, the the demiurge isn't a temporary situation the demiurge is how all of this stuff is here very well said very well said and i think uh uh, I love your work on aenology and archonology. So, and of course, I always tell people, you know, just go read that. I tell them to go read the, the red line and all that just for, uh, uh, a bag of, uh, red pills on a, on a weekly basis. Again, to keep saying to, to see these layers of reality. So maybe you tell the listeners a little bit about these two, uh, projects, aenology and archonology. Yeah, sure. So, archaeology began oh maybe 2012 back in London when I went looking for because it became obvious uh, living in London and sort of having uh, sporadic exposure to powerful people for whom I was occasionally useful um, in in media and so on. You kind of got glimpses of of a, a top of the pyramid um, even at my middling level that made you realize that this is. This is structured differently. What if you haven't had experience with terrestrial power, as in, you know, people whose fathers are in Burke's peerage and 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 so on? Um, I wanted to find a way of providing physical evidence for the fact that, particularly with the sort of Anglo-American elite, a lot of the foundational stories, particularly the twentieth century's um, history, are ops uh, and they're ops with a kind of in, uh, intention to entrap or seize control it's that demiurgical sin so archaeology i thought obviously it's a play on uh, archaeology because it was about digging for the specific artifacts in in the kind of behaviors of the archons and that necessarily a few years later when i realized at some point you have to uh and i'm not sure and I'll, I'll, I'll ask your opinion of this in a second miguel but i'm not sure if the gnostics got this mix quite right but at some point, you have to stop looking at the evil. Uh, you have to be satisfied that you're not going to get that the evil is there. And you have to start looking at the non-evil. You have to start looking at, okay, so reality is structured as, as, as an op. Um, and whether you believe that cosmically or whether, quote-unquote, simply you only believe it in a material sense. How many times do you have to – how often do you have to keep looking at – um, often quite debasing and gross uh, behind the scenes behaviors of, of a psychopathic elite before you're satisfied because otherwise it does get quite sick and you get um, caught in this infinite loop of, of focusing on the negative and so necessarily at the beginning of the year or the end of last year I thought the um, ionology was the opposite which is to kind of demonstrate that even though um, our situations are what they are Good things still exist. Good things are still available, and uh, and I'm not sure what your opinion of that is from the Gnostic perspective, but it does seem uh, a lot of the time that the most popular texts are the ones that go into the the greatest detail on the bad guys, <laughs> rather than the good guys, and that <laughs> that is a challenging balance. Um, but what do you think? Do you think maybe they uh, do you think they got that right in aggregate, or would we go group by group on that? Uh, we could certainly go group by group. I would say overall, I think you hit it on the head. And I think, uh, Chris, you and I discussed this about like Antifa or Antifa, whatever you call them, being Gnostic. Uh, they sort of get half of the equation right. There's the cosmic rebellion. There's the rescue operation. There's the awakening and all that. But after that, it's pretty much given that there's the world as you say is structured as its structure the solution and i know i'm gonna i'm borrowing from aa but the gnostics would agree the solution is a spiritual solution and the solution is always uh at the end of the day like i tell people the ultimate quest and this is uh, this is something that eric davis the great philip k d scholar said the ultimate thrust for the gnostics is liberation and uh as you write in the chaos protocols it's about being invincible 
that's that's really what it comes down to is uh becoming free so uh and i don't think you can become free if you're always fighting the empire would it philip k dick to fight the empires to become infected by their derangement so i think we agree on that one right yeah absolutely when i gave um uh, the talk in la in july of this year with uh connor habib one of the things that we wanted to get across because obviously it was a very uh, it was an audience it's la for a start but also a magical community but there was more a left-leaning audience and and the um the challenges with that is that the foundational premises emerge from this sort of materialist positivism so the um the emotional and political sentiment of um leaning towards greater equality or greater egalitarian are good um, however, if they unfold out of materialism, you just get stuck in in the empire, and uh, and that was one of the things. Fortunately, I do see um, because I do try to see the glass of vodka half full, given that we're coming up to New Year's. Um, <laughs> I do see in medium term that culturally this gets better. We have it's so difficult to collectively think with new ideas, and and so the sort of eighteen months since the election are an example of of kind of like letting the tap run um, for a while because the water is dirty and then eventually it will run clear. Underneath a lot of ideas and 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 kind of emotional reactions that we might look at um, on our best days as being a bit naive are necessary steps in that direction. And it becomes how one engages so that that these kind of changes and the magical renaissance and so on um retains the the vitality to be what it needs to be in uh, as we as we look out across 2018 and a, a key component of that is a uh, foundational understanding and you won't get it publicly in in academia very much if at all uh, is the foundational understanding that any if your proposed solutions emerge from this sort of um materialist positivist um, solutionism, and that is the same if it's capitalism or if it's socialism or so on. Um, people need to jump down to the next level and make sure that they've planted their positions and their goals in in soil that will actually grow things. And I think we're at the stage where we can um, we can have those discussions, and this might be that that necessary phase. Uh, the other thing, and I'm, I'm this is almost a bit gnostic, and I, I appreciate the challenge in in, in doing so, is. Um, Something Catherine Fitz said a couple of years ago, which has stayed with me, is the situation is too serious to for us to afford the luxury of being angry. And I uh, mm, love it. Me too. And although, like all of us, that's that sounds good when you're away from the computer and then you wake up in the morning and because I'm in Australia, obviously, and you see what's happened overnight, which is a day in the US, and uh, and that gets difficult. That you do find the anger, but uh, it's quite a good idea to sort of paste up on your mirror or something because it's it's true i mean wherever you land on the political spectrum or um however from an environmental perspective or so on um this is not it, it's playing for keeps now and uh, and and i think we need to kind of think about that in a calm way and then look at what uh potentialities and and kind of skills we have as humans which is in that Gnostic sense, that you are an, essentially an unkillable fragment of the true God, that seems to me a better place to start than a um, a kind of materialist, industrialist, anger-based guess at how economies work. I think I think being a unkillable shard of God is is a is better soil to grow in. Well said. What about you, Vince? Are you too angry to ask any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I do tend to get angry, but I was uh, wondering, Gordon, if you think there's any utility in trying to discover who these archons are or who their agents are, and then maybe dig up um, a notch up to the spiritual level and see if you can identify with actual spiritual entities. And, you know, you mentioned a map before, too, so I was wondering, how do we Gnostics actually create a map to you know navigate these horrible waters of untruth propaganda you know being uh, manipulated i think if you'd asked me that it's a great question vance but i think if you'd asked me that a couple of years ago my answer would be different to what it is in the closing days of 2017 because yes there is one um you said utility so we'll we'll sort of narrow it down to that 
Yeah. And there is a, a very good utilitarian case to be made for finding out where um, which pools have the sharks in them and, and where the quicksand is and, and so on, so that one may navigate uh, around them is probably what I'd say at the end of 2017, which is um, you kind of come to the conclusion, as I said before, like um, reality is, is wildly stage managed, more, not as much as maybe people fear, but so much more than they typically think. And whatever it takes to get you to realize that so that you never fall into that um, trap again so that you're never kind of used as as a momentum there is absolutely a utilitarian case to be made for it and especially as you say when we kind of scale that up to incorporating spiritual realities which is is there um at an anglo-american elite level someone like um in the 19th century you know cecil rhodes is he can we on what level can we say he really was a demon or an archon and at what level do we are we using that only metaphorically or um is there some sort of um back end to roads that sort of back ends into into an archonic realm uh i think there is it is very useful to think with ideas in that way because um whether or not people agree and i you know Miguel and I have spoken about this before. The common criticisms leveled at, at Gnosticism are, and to, to some extent they're valid, it's a um, negative opinion of the natural world. Be that as it may, you will not find a single culture anywhere on earth, any when, going back 70,000 years as far as I can tell, that does not have a demon in some form, does not have demons, does not have spirits that are openly hostile to mankind. Well, now, actually. yeah, so... When we're talking about Gnosticism, obviously they have demons as well, but um, we are talking in an iconic sense. So yes, on a purely utilitarian basis, I do think once you've kind of done the the, the materialism, almost conspiracy wall of, of working out what does power look like when it moves in the dark in your world, um, I think there is on a utilitarian basis a very good case to be made for kicking that uh, exploration up into into the non-physical if only because it provides a sense of urgency to kind of turn around and look at yourself and say well right well i'm going to work on my spiritual then uh instead but yes uh i i do think utilitarianly and then there's the other side of it which is as spiritual seekers of, of whatever flavor you are um if you do it wrong you're a 19th century naturalist if you do it correctly you're a 21st century naturalist and i've just given some talks uh, in australia about the changes that are happening in in the kind of um conservation world that i, I view as very positive but you you kind of uh you kind of like these things you kind of like knowing about them and 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 always going back and, and understanding and, and categorizing them and i i do think that's an unavoidable part of the experience for people who want to assert sovereignty over the over their you know their spiritual journey so on a utilitarian basis fans yes absolutely uh and even on a spiritual basis there's a lot to be said for it um however again we come back to that risk of like demons are just simply very interesting and it is and and horror is something that's very difficult to look away from uh we should um uh, perhaps part of the trick is that it, it is so compelling to look at it that we forget the tremendous power we have and the things that we can do. And uh, and I don't have a good answer for what that really would be fun to be able to say. 30% look at demons, 70% work on, on on your own life. But obviously that um, that breaks down on an, on an individual and a, and a contextual basis. But uh, it's, it's important, I think, in a macro sense. And this is kind of what I mean about, I guess, re-enchanting, particularly leftist politics, is... Um, we need to openly say these things. We need to kind of openly, w within communities that are looking to uh, make the changes that we... I'm, I'm making some assumptions because you're California events, but um, we, <laughs> we need to be able to uh, turn around to, I hate using these words, but like quote-unquote allies and, and just openly say there is a spiritual and demonic dimension to what's going on and it, you're not being a grown-up by pretending it's not there you're not being a grown-up by um, parroting intersectionalist words you learned in in your kind of sophomore 
um, humanity subject. That's not what being a grown up is. What being a grown up is, is um, is having this frank, honest conversation that um, the mission, for want of a better word, is is extra dimensional as well as material, and uh, and that's kind of what I mean by I think we're getting. 2018, I'm broadly positive, um, can start having those discussions in in a more scalable way. Yeah, that's good. Um, you know, don't worry about me, by the way. Um, I'm the one who says you can't fly a bird without two wings. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody's perfectly evil. Nobody's perfectly good. So even the people that might represent archons have must have some good in them. Otherwise, we do well, that I like. You find a similar thing, at least at certain points in, in the story of the grimoires, that everything that fell will one day be lifted up in Christ, because obviously it's a Christian context. But what they means is that what, what it means, and you find that as a kind of implied teleology in, in places like early modern English grimoires, that Lucifer himself will one day be redeemed at the end of the universe. And and I agree in in that sense that here is another kind of um, valuable insight that comes with having a Gnostic map, which is um, yeah, e- even the black guy in prison has um, has prisoners that will one day be redeemed, or prison guards. Well, good thing because we're all in the black iron prison. <laughs> amen, amen, and also uh, Gordon. It seems 2017 was a year of uh, when conspiracy theories became mainstream. What advice do you have for people? Because it seems everybody's gripped by their own conspiracy theory. We're all, or a lot of people are trapped in their reality tunnels, uh, bringing in raw. What advice do you have with all this? Uh, Well, again, we're questioning reality, but perhaps going a little too far. Oh, well, sure. But um, you can push that out in both directions simultaneously. And I think we should. So you're correct that, and it's, it's how we live in Gnostic times. Um, People who aren't familiar with navigating, navigating the fact that the powerful will lie to you are um, have, have this really idiotic or or low resolution understanding of, of conspiracy theory, which is a binary. So um, they are right to reject the kind of, very lurid and in you know in the in the Alex Jones direction. They're absolutely correct. However, um what that means is that they are more comfortable with the official conspiracy theory. Um because that's all we have on offer in, in 2017. We have evidence free um Russian collusion nonsense. We have the, the word hack has been destroyed. Do you, how do you hack an election? Is there anyone technical out there who can explain <laughs> to me. me but this is how you see that's this yeah <laughs> that's the same kind of dumbing down and, and deliberate use of words that we saw with the election where they start using words like fake news and it's it's these dumb sharp stupid words um and that's by design that has been an mk program uh, approach since the cold war to kind of have these sloganistic dumb words and and hack is the latest one. So um, how do you hack a political party or how do you hack an election? You know, hacking is, is a kind of a getting into a specific computer or network, not a, not this kind of demonic roving word. So um, conspiracy theory is is um, is all that happened in 2017. And it happened from the um, the, the smug and, and underinformed presumably hard in the right place liberals who um, stick with the evidence free official ones. And it also happened in the lurid corners of the internet where people have a preference for the unofficial ones. So yes, as you kind of said, Miguel, you know, there's basically nothing but conspiracy theory in, in 2017 and almost on a personality basis is where you line up all your tolerance for um, behaving without, I guess, the approval of authority. And and you can kind of just tip people into those two camps. Do they want the internet conspiracies uh, or do they want the kind of um, swivel-eyed Joy Reid nonsense where everyone who... um, Everyone who falls out of line from the the Democratic Party is being paid by the Russians. Like, this is... They are both really dumb and 100% false ideas. And uh, and that's why we live in Gnostic times. You brought up Grant Morrison... In the Invisibles, that's the whole premise, right? All conspiracy theories are true. 
So it seems like that yeah. would be the perfect Archon move is just make them all true. Well, that yes, uh, that is absolutely correct. It's um, you you kind of it's this is how thinking with these ideas in an extra dimensional sense actually gives you increasing clarity because it's just one of those um, if you don't uh, ascribe spiritual reality to the universe, it's just this really bizarre coincidence that um, all of reality is arranged as if it was run by demons seeking seeking to track to like trap us, right? And that's right. one of them. And I think um, what you know it lost its way a little bit towards the end. But why it was such a potent '90s Gnostic text is that sense of continuity, like um, the idea that the empire never ended is a sort of end of 20th century update to the century that also gave us you know great caches of, of Gnostic text to say this is not a frozen in time perspective this is alive and it's true it's economically and historically true that you have a handover of um a kind of command and control approach to the world from the british empire to the american empire and uh before that you have different groups that are trying to do it and then going back to rome rome is the sort of framework inspiration for um the british empire on a lyrical basis but it's a, on a practical basis for the american empire which is a empire of military bases it's, it's a direct match for the roman empire so you look at it and think the empire really didn't end like it is it is it is a structural component to uh um to how we live and uh and that you know again gnostic times what else can you say not much not much and um what i like to tell people and of course give me your view is uh i think if you want to know the truth don't worry too much about blog posts or Alex Jones or that Twitter thread, but just read some history. I mean, for example, recently this fall, I finally got around to reading uh, Quigley's Tragedy and Hope. I got Very around good. to read Talbot's uh, The Devil's Chessboard or Chess Game. And uh, those were, it was like, in a way, reading the Nag Hammadi. It was, it, I tell people it's worse. Don't worry about uh, it or anything. I mean, this is... Uh, the horror in these books is amazing, but it's also the whole structure of these archons of these elite. I mean, the map is right there, what they do. And if you read that, you can really, you can start, you actually start thinking like the CIA or the Council of Foreign Relations or anything like that. It's all there. And uh, I think, don't you think people just need to read more history? Well, absolutely. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And, you know, you never cease to surprise and impress me, Miguel, because um, Tragedy and Hope is a really difficult read. Um, yes, say what you will least. about Carol Quigley. He's not a very good writer. Um, he was, by all accounts, a very good historian. And uh, and as you say, it's this isn't – and it's kind of why I resurrected the Archonology series to go through – these sort of archonic texts and we're only about two thirds of the way through. Um, well, actually we might well be done by the time this, uh, this comes out and tragedy and hope is the main one that the others sort of swing around because this isn't, um, you, you, you have to read it before you want to start like tweeting breathless tweets about, um, the Russians <laughs> or so on, because, you have it just kind of coolly and plainly laid out that you have a kind of multi-century plan to to essentially array as like embodied archons or an embodied demiurge to sort of arrange reality with them at the top. And this isn't, um, as you say, you don't need Alex Jones or Reddit or any of that stuff for it. The actual history of the world will do it. But this is again why why you you need the spiritual component to it, right? So it's interesting that at the time we need to read history books probably the most in the last hundred years is the time where we read the least, where we have the lowest attention spans, where particularly in the case of Americans, you're over-medicated 70% um, of psychotropics and, and I think it's 85% of all psychiatric medicines go to less than 5% of the population. So, And also, you're um, depending on a state-by-state -state basis, you have an education system in the toilet. So you're graduating adults you can't read who are addicted to drugs that uh, affect their um, thinking capacities and they haven't learned anything at school to kind of help them um, navigate whether you can find historical information and the libraries are being closed like how what, a, what an unusual combination of events that aligns up with where we are um geopolitically and you think that even if it's wrong the, the best map the best shortcut through this morass is is a gnostic one and, and i'm very glad that you um you read tragedy Hope because there's no coming back 
and the Dulles book as well, Devil's Chessboard. You read those two, and I would almost, not that I would ever recommend this to people, but you can almost start watching mainstream news again because it's still 90% false, but, you know, except for the food segments, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but you now have the... Um, the sort of decision tree in your mind to work out who's saying what and why all of a sudden you get these flapping talking heads from some think tank and you go, oh, I see what you're doing there. Yeah. You're presenting this as news, but it's, and, and that is a really good first step. And I do actually hope if we're looking for things people can do in 2018, uh, these books, the most important books for kind of unpacking how the Anglo American empire works and is working are approaching 100 years old and very easy to find in their entirety online. And if not, they're very affordable. So um, if people are looking for New Year's resolutions, uh, may I recommend reading some, and I'm just telling you now, slightly difficult books to read and uh, and, and just sitting there and, and reading them. Yeah, I agreed, but I don't think I'm glad to have read them, Gordon. In a way, I almost wish I hadn't. I mean, the ignorance is bliss because – once you read it, it is like a red pill. I mean, you're, you can't, as you like to say, you can't put that, uh, uh, toothpaste back in the tube. I mean, you see it how it is and it is a horror. I mean, Alan Dulles, I can't believe he's not mentioned as one of the most evil men and I can't even call him evil. He's kind of like Matthew Modine in the stranger things. He is the, the pragmatist, the perfect, uh, agent. He, he moves things forward. I mean, it's, um, it's almost like that Nietzsche beyond good and evil. And where it gets even creepier, which um, this is an excellent book, and it is the best book on the Dulleses that anyone's written. There aren't that many, right? Um, it doesn't do sufficient justice to his European interactions um, with, you know, with the likes of um, Mr. James Bond himself and Jung and so on. So he's actually picking up the pragmatism is is what. People think it's a good word. It's 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 a sort of English school of philosophy, and it is a good word. It's not great as a school of philosophy, uh, because with pragmatism, it essentially that's a nice way of just saying will to power. Pragmatism is doing or saying anything to get more power, and that without any underlying metaphysical truths or, or anything. And and Alan Dulles was the ultimate fulfillment officer for that kind of Anglo-American 20th century pragmatism. He was the Darth Vader of, of Quigley's round table groups because he rearranged multiple continents um, to keep the Anglo-American kind of project going at the top. And if you can read that, it's just astounding because you, you know, obviously you have Dulles Airport and many things named after various Dulles brothers and, and some of the banks there on the board for still exist and so on. And you think, my goodness, the empire really didn't ever end. And, uh, and you're kind of free when you say you almost wish you didn't read it. I don't think too many people take the blue pill. I really don't. I think, uh, um, I think clarity is terrifying um, and, and, and more uncomfortable. But I think once you know that there is a red and blue pill option, I think most people take the red. I actually think that is the response of the di divine spark um, buried in us. I think it's uh, um, I think truth always wins. And I think it's something we grow towards. It is uncomfortable, um, but um, I would Yes. Can you imagine, not that I think this happens, but at the end of your life, if you'd kind of gone through it head in the sand and, and didn't know this stuff, and then you kind of get to the afterlife and it's like, well, actually, <laughs> this <laughs> is, what's is going not going to be happening. I would yeah. feel ripped off at that point. And I think most people would. But I, I, also, think, um, I also think people don't realize that there is a genuine red, red and blue pill. And this comes back to how 2017 is nothing but a conspiracy theory. I don't think people realize there is a genuine red and blue pill option that is the sane, the only sane and rational choice is to have a baseline in, in starting to understand how, how power networks operate so that you don't ever trust Twitter or CNN or, or anything <laughs> again. And that's not a lurid position that is the only sane position in an insane world. Agreed. And it's interesting because, um, I know uh, Tessa Dick put out a sort of a memoir or a book about Philip K. Dick, and he would walk around mumbling, uh, the Germans lost the war, but the Nazis won the war. 
And I thought it was very interesting. But again, you read these texts and uh, you realize, yes, the Nazis really did win the war, didn't they, Gordon? And it's not just the, the Nazis people talk about on social media. No, no, it's the real Nazis, not just the people you disagree with. So it's the actual Nazi international that interlocks into the um, the dramatic development of um, corrupt South American governments and also the space program and, and pharma and, and everything else and and the intelligence apparatus of, of the um, the Cold War United States. Uh, and they were essentially a supranational state uh, at that point. But more alarmingly than that, the uh, the actual, like the real Nazi worldview of the actual Nazis um, in Germany a third of the way through the 20th century was shared before and after with the Anglo-American elite. So these various uh, kind of Rockefeller foundations um, from the 19th century that focus on eugenics and, and gave us the beginnings of the environmental movement because they were trying to make sure that only smart people breed. And and they, the, funnily enough, smart people fell into a very specific skin color. Um, but yeah. that, um, that Rockefeller-funded eugenics program was running – uh, on the U.S. East Coast and in Germany, in Nazi Germany at the same time, obviously prior to the war, but the attitude is is the same. And you have, you know, immediately after the war, U.S. generals saying that, you know, our guns should have been pointing in the opposite direction, as in they, we should have allied with the Nazis against the Soviets. And um, so you have a you have a double thing. You have the insidiousness, which is um, that technocratic, materialist, uh, racially supreme attitude of the Anglo-American elite, which the Nazis shared, predates and postdates it and indeed continues. And you also have the, the physical reality that a supranational group of, um, you know, some people have called it the Fourth Reich, but like the Nazi international was a real and may well still be, but definitely was a real force in 20th century uh, geopolitics, particularly when it came to the Americas. And this is this stuff isn't, you know, um, I'm not about to sell you supplements. Like this isn't the kind of like screaming um, sources within the Pentagon have told me stuff. This is just open and shut history. And that that baseline, if you have that, um, is probably a good start so that you can navigate power structures without going crazy. Yes, and for the audience, definitely check out, uh, if you want more me, check out Operation Paperclip, uh, Operation Gladio, and a whole bunch of others. But uh, what about you, Vance, my boy from Brazil? What do you, do you have a question? Oh, yeah. I just saw a possibility, Gordon, that I'd like to run by you. Could it be that what we're seeing on the planet, maybe this is a new conspiracy theory, is two very powerful but distinct groups who both want to control the world one you could identify with the left wing like the communist socialist so forth the other one you could identify with the nazis which is more of an industrialist still socialist because um you know they um want to organize things but they both have in common the fact that there's an elite group that's going to control everything because everybody else is too stupid we're just cheap right what do you think of that I, that might explain a lot of things um, short answer, yes. Long answer is, and I've kind of been going over this the last couple of years, um, the sort of war in deep state model is um, itself an op because it does kind of suggest that this real estate billionaire is going to ride in on a white horse and, and, and defend the average American and the world from, I don't know, trans activist Clintonites or something. And that's not correct because there's absolutely no way a New York real estate billionaire is, is the sort of savior of mankind. What I do think you're seeing is at the top, a downsizing of the management model. So going back to Quigley, you have his kind of round table um, inner circle. And this is, these things don't, really exist although they might but how he described the power structure particularly the anglo-american power structure was an an inner circle of the Rhodes and jp morgans and rockefellers and so on and outside of that you had his association or society of helpers which is people who believe it um and non-profits academics people who are paid to believe it or actually just believe it and this is the sort of fulfillment layer of the 
Anglo-American control mechanism. It's the one that leads to, you know, the, the classic examples being Hillary taking tens of million dollars from the Saudis for a charity that supports women, or um, Joe Biden put it, you know, after the um, Democratic State Department collapsed Ukraine by colluding with actual Nazis, then moves Biden moves his son in to run like the energy business and so on. This is the kind of fulfillment layer of that um, expansion. And it's expensive and I think it's being downsized. So everything at that layer um, is no longer needed to fulfill the uh, Anglo-American objectives, um, the super elite objectives of what I'm talking about here. It's no longer needed. It's very expensive to physically occupy a country and it's very expensive to send people in and collapse it and so on. And I think we're at a stage in quote unquote their plan where the um, the digital systems and, and control of satellites is is, is so great that you don't need to invade a place. You can sort of digitally collapse it. You can digitally collapse individual people. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing instead. And I think because the fulfillment layer, and again, um, being corruption personified, the Clintons are like demonic um, Bonnie and Clyde's are, are a perfect example of it. Um, you make a lot of money being a bag man for the empire. And when the music stops, you're going to try and turn it back on. So I don't think you're seeing a good guy, bad guy fight. Um, what I think you're seeing is like the actual top of the pyramid. And I have no idea. Oh. Uh, I'm using that metaphorically. And I have no idea what that is. It's pulling the plug on the expensive, loud and unpopular fulfillment layer. Uh, and that's of kind guy, of the model. Guy, guy fight. Yeah. You know, I was thinking of a bad guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, guy. in that case. Two yes, warring factions, case, both evil, trying to control the planet. Yes, so I don't think Trump drains the swamp because he's part of it. Um, but I think the top of the pyramid is, is draining the macro swamp, which is um, a lot of that um, that NGO fulfillment um, corruption layer. And a lot of what you're seeing, a lot of what you're seeing in um, what passes for U.S. news to do with um, the sort of guilt by accusation, um, sex assault thing that's going on, and and all these people losing their jobs for, for lying and and what have you, is the um, the use of control files to down to continue downsizing that um, fulfillment and propaganda layer, which is also how you got the tax reform to sail through because you just need to hang a few um, sex criminals out to dry and the rest of them fall into line. And uh, and that's, that was how Hoover ran Washington. Again, we go back to history. That's literally how Hoover ran Washington and it's how propaganda due ran Italy. And, uh, and we're just seeing that now and uh by the way that doesn't mean these people are innocent or um it gets them off the hook for being sex criminals right but it right nevertheless the information is being used for the downsizing rather than um yeah i'll just leave it at that it doesn't mean i i think these people are innocent or they're being unjustly accused they uh, by all accounts most of them have admitted it by all accounts yeah but, by the are, way my prediction but, is rock stars are next <laughs> Could be. I think. Uh, Ringo you Starr, the, you're 16. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it it might be. If it is, it will be the ones that. Um, what you're seeing with the the sort of the names that uh, are getting hit in Hollywood, because the reality is Hollywood, they're all into it. Like that's literally the golden age of Hollywood was. Um, having sex with 16 year old ingenues fresh off the bus from Ohio. That's uh, you, 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 you watch classic Hollywood films now, and there's literally all they're about. Um, so everyone in that town is gross. Uh, but if you look at the kind of hits that have gone down, um, George Takei had the largest pay for play Democrat um, Facebook slash social audience. Um, the Weinstein, uh, well, the Weinstein company, but Harvey Weinstein is friends with the Clintons and, and gave a lot of money, money to the Democratic Party. And, and if you look at the, and the precise hits around the, um, the kind of like terrible comic movie world, because if you add all these together, what you actually have is, not that I'm saying it's, it's the good guys, but you have the counter voice to what's going on. And you kind of need to remove its moral authority and, and make sure it's gross. Now people don't want to watch understandably they don't want to watch kevin spacey film it's kind of weird to and i'm a buffy fan it's kind of weird to watch just wedding stuff now and you just go along the list of all these things and there's a very deliberate hit and i think particularly when they went for weinstein that was the head on the spike um on london bridge like that you hang a traitor there so the rest of them know um 
whoever's at the top isn't messing about with this and and their kind of air cover is gone so if it is rock stars it won't be for instance kid rock because for whatever reason kid rock wants to <laughs> run for president as presumably a republican so yeah why uh, not but it might <laughs> but it, i mean it won't be sure but it might be sure like anyone who's kind of in that same um hashtag i'm with her liberal air cover uh is appears to be fair game you're still getting a couple of um you know republicanish people in it but if you look at the hits into the new york times and hollywood and the democratic party and so on i think all of this was to let people know that the tax reform has to sail through and uh and it will wow big price for that huh you know it's funny um Obama got into office precisely because of one of these things with Jack Ryan. Do you remember that? Yeah, this, but Hollywood, I do very well. Um, Hollywood and Washington run on control files. It, it was the, yeah. and it still is, and it kind of always has been, but you just, there's a, funnily enough, speaking of kind of like Hollywood liberals, um, there's that reasonably good Leonardo DiCaprio film about um, Hoover that came out about 10 years ago. So if this is all new to you and you're listening, um, J. Edgar Hoover ran the government of the most powerful country on earth by control files, by spying on everyone and, and entrapping them with honey traps and, and, and all this kind of thing. And uh, and it worked. And I think we're seeing them being used now. And there's no one at a senior level in, in politics anywhere in, in the West that gets to a seat, like to a level without something in their control file. And what's terrifying about that in the 21st century is if you don't have anything, if, if you, which is impossible, but if you don't, they'll make it up. Um, the, the evidence is digital. They will they will find child pornography on your computer. They will do whatever it happens to be. But um, that's what you see. What looks like news or, or this kind of moral panic in this guilt by action fight is control files. Again, you, you under, if you read the mid-20th century books that we were just talking about, you have a way of, of interpreting that that kind of passes the signal from the noise. Yeah, you can see it coming in... Uh... I think, uh, yeah, speaking of, now it's getting very hard to watch the X-Men films. Thanks, Brian Singer. I really yeah, like your work. Yeah, tip of the iceberg, him too. Like, take, take, take three <laughs> it's years off, on, um, yeah. 17, and, and you get to the, um, you get to the real Brian Singer stories. So, yes. And that's what I mean. They, these hits that are, you kind of can't watch them. I have a friend of mine in London. She's a comedian and she had this whole bit about, um, house of cards in, in an award-winning set from earlier in the year she was, we're, she was telling me that she was um presenting the set immediately after the kevin spacey things not really thinking about it um at, at an awards show and everyone in the audience starts going Ugh. and she says wow i'm actually gonna have to update this and it's funny the hits that have been <laughs> um <laughs> and, and you look at it and go that's you know um th- these shots are too clumsy or random for sand people these are imperial blasters right They're, these are very strategic hits of people that are being brought down for a message management purpose agreed but i guess the the next question would be gordon uh you talk about hoover running the government but uh both you and chris have agreed in the last year or so that there is uh, a war in heaven so what is going on? Do, can we see who are these uh, angels fighting each other beyond the clouds? Is it still going no, on? I, no, I don't think we can. Um, <laughs> we So the war in heaven is the other way of doing the, the sort of downsizing of the control mechanisms. And it's for whatever reason at the very top, and we'll get back to them in a sec. Um, and I, I don't mean like the billionaire level, kind of weird a, a weird group that meets every 37 years in, in a in a in Monaco kind of weird, a sort of cartoon villain top of a pyramid, right. um, which may or may not exist. And, and it probably does in some way. Uh, they, for whatever reason, pulling the plug on the kind of fulfillment layer of running the world has happened now. And it's just interesting when you look at the other stuff that has happened now or over the last several decades. And there is clearly some something to do with the very ancient past, something to do with space, something to do with all these kind of things that is is working to to a clock, which is it's time to do it now. Now, part of it is that the technological systems for dominance without invasion are now online. We have them, and and you sort of see that underneath cryptocurrencies as well. So that's part of it. But nevertheless, you kind of have really weird 
um, aesthetic and ritual decisions and timings that are going on that um, don't make a lot of sense unless you leave open the possibility that the, the, at the top, these things, whether it's true or not, have some kind of um, some kind of alien belief system. And and in there are two things to say about that. Firstly, this would be a natural extension of the kind of right to rule by bloodline belief that um, royalty has has always had. So, if you look at the House of Windsor, Charles is very fond of mentioning that he um, is related to Dracula, which he and and the royal family has related to Muhammad and so on, because they spend all this time, money, kind of plugging their bloodlines in and and so on. So, as the 20th century developed and we learned more about Spain and you know, hypothetical aliens and, and the distant past. There is almost a natural progression of that belief system uh, at the top. There is also the very distinct possibility that that belief system is based on something in addition to that natural progression, given the, um, especially when it comes to things like uh, Gnostic texts and, and Akkadian tablets and, and all the kind of stuff we're interested in, that interest has remained um, extremely difficult to satisfy at, at a at a super elite level. The um, it is only a minority of Sumerian tablets that are publicly available. The majority of them are privately purchased, and not privately purchased by a foundation to go into, uh, you know, a university department. Privately purchased, and so you kind of put those things together, and then you look at the bizarre behavior and aesthetic decisions, and go, it is, it is not unreasonable to make the assertion that there is an entirely separate cosmology at uh, operating at a, at the tip of the tip that's potentially working to a calendar, which is why, you know, 2017 it looked like what it did for instance. And, uh, and that's just beyond that is you can kind of draw a line in the sand and go, well, I th I th that's, that's a reasonable discussion. And then after that you're in, and I think it's healthy and, and needs to be done as long as you kind of say it up front. And after that you let's spitball this, Let's try and find out what that might like, uh, and so on, because it's um, it, it's very difficult to, to build a hypothesis of of what they think they're doing or what they think they want without that, and or without the kind of interaction of the extra dimensional, which we were talking about earlier. Yes, I even told Chris we're dealing with uh, wickedness in high places, in spiritual places. The answer is still spiritual. And uh, this also Chris and I talked about is uh, obviously something people need to understand is that the elite, these powers and principalities on the material plane, they are most definitely using magic against and, uh, against us, aren't they? 100%. Uh, and if you don't, <laughs> we, yeah, it's... um. If you say no, you don't know how magic works. Um, like it's it's a binary, and then I say no, they aren't. I'm like I'm afraid they are. It, and again, this is a kind of progression and step change idea because they always have. If you've you know read some of my stuff before, I I, I have. I think a sufficiently broad definition of magic so that it can include. Advertising, for instance, because you have a consciousness change effect by showing people different images and sounds and, and so on. And that, because of the foundational basis of reality being consciousness, is literally magic. So it, like, you can just knock that no, they're not using magic on the head simply by saying, well, advertising is magic. Um, that's the kind of progression piece. There is nevertheless the step change piece, which is um, – if you have that that unlimited money and that capacity in an X file syndicate sense to walk into and out of um, military contractors, the CAA, think tanks, uh, genetic studies, experimental physics labs, uh, archaeological departments, and you can kill with impunity and get away with it, and you have just uh, because you print the money, you have unlimited money. Um, I could I could get you spacecraft in under ten years. It like um, electrogravitic spacecraft. You and I, Miguel and Vance, you can come along. We'll add an extra seat. Um, I can get you a I All can right. get you a flying saucer in ten years. Uh, these people have had seventy years and and a, and a changed view of of the distant past, which we only get pieces of. So they're using real magic in in my definition as well as kind of the magic that they have always used, which is imagery and so on. Like the, the English are inevitably very good at this. Um, Elizabeth the first uh, made sure, and this is an ad campaign, but it's also magic and it worked. Uh, 
made sure that there was she would approve like in a brand book every depiction of her that would go into churches and kind of guild halls up and down the country once they had removed all the catholic iconography and so on and it was this very deliberate apple style branding to imprint the virgin queen and it worked and the population and of course you had john d and and uh, humphrey gilbert and all these other wizards as, as advisors and people circling around her that is how they roll it's just in the 20th i think they may have uh found some toys or techniques to augment how they've always rolled all right well i think we've come to the end uh again thank you very much gordon always great having you on and getting your uh, perspective on things on any subject really appreciate it yeah absolutely and uh you know happy 2018 to you both uh, likewise happy 2018 and thanks for being here too vance my pleasure. And there you have it. The first part of Gordon's interview on a Gnostic and Magical Overview 2017. And predictions to keep your sanity and very soul in 2018. Gordon is killing the Demiurge softly with his Gnosis. In our second part, Gordon speculates on why we might be due for another 9-11 event, and what to do about it, and other false flag attacks. Could an engineer black plague or another bioweapon be in the works for civilization? We also discuss what is going on in Saudi Arabia, the new seat of Archons and a false Sophia the role of the real Sophia herself in modern times, the rise of transhumanism and eugenics, and what relevant insights does the Book of Revelation have in modern times, and much more. You can certainly tie this interview with the one we did with Chris Knowles recently. We're not a glum lot in this interview, however, as Gordon shares his favorite movies and books of 2017 as do Vance and yours truly. You'll be surprised at some. And we even enjoy a little round table of Gnostic concepts in Star Trek. A lot of fun weaved in serious, darkly themes. Only $5.99 a month to join. You get complete and partial shows. Access to more than 375 episodes with the best and brightest in Gnosticism, Western esoteric and free thought. You get your own private RSS feed where you can listen to all complete shows on a podcaster of your choice. Invitation to our Inner Sanctum of Gnosis Facebook group where we are building a community of mystics, madmen and sages. Many past guests hang out there, and I'm always there to directly and personally answer your questions and issues, too. Same benefits if you become a patron at Patreon, except you get early shows. If anything, a few shekels here and there via PayPal or the US mail. Let's keep this Red Pill Cafeteria open, and let's keep that content coming, and help you navigate the many false flags and Mandela effects coming at you in 2018. It's only going to get more intense as reality breaks opens, and the Demiurge slouches towards Jerusalem, and you sprint to Alexandria. And I'll certainly be with you every step of the way. Hello and goodbye as always.